By August, Free France had some funds, had the rudiments of an organization, and enjoyed some popularity. I had to make immediate use of all this. If on some issues I felt hesitant, as for the necessary immediate action, I had no doubts. Hitler had succeeded in winning the first stage of the battle in Europe. The second stage was to take place on a world scale. It could happen that the future battle would unfold on the soil of the European continent. In anticipation of this, we French had to continue the fight in Africa. I intended to continue the war, which I had urged in vain a few weeks before by the French government and military commanders. I intended to pursue this course as soon as their representatives, who had not been reconciled to surrender, would join me. Indeed, France could, in the vast expanse of Africa, revitalize her army and her sovereignty in anticipation of the period when the participation in the War of the New Allies, along with the old, would change the balance of power. In this case, Africa, located near the Apennine Balkan and Iberian peninsulas, would serve as an excellent initial frontier in French hands for a return to Europe. Furthermore, if France was liberated in the future through the efforts of the entire French Empire, ties between the metropolis and its overseas possessions would be strengthened. Otherwise, if the war ended and the empire did nothing to save its metropolis, France's cause in Africa would undoubtedly be lost. It was to be expected, however, that the Germans would move the war to the Mediterranean, either to create a roadblock to Europe, or to conquer the colonies there, or to help their allies, the Italians, and perhaps the Spaniards, to expand their possessions. There was already fighting going on in Africa. The Axis countries were seeking to seize Suez. If we continued to behave passively in Africa, the enemies would sooner or later seize some of our possessions, and even the Allies would be forced in the course of combat operations to occupy those of our territories which they would need strategically. The participation of French armed forces and French territories in the Battle of Africa would have signalled that a certain part of France had re-entered the war. It would have meant a direct defence of her possessions against the enemy and prevented, to the extent possible, England and probably in the future America, from seizing these territories for the purpose of war and for their own interests. It would help free France at last to return from exile and begin to exercise sovereign rights in her national territory. But how to penetrate Africa? I could not count on Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia in the near future. It is true that at first I received many telegrams from there about municipalities, organisations, officers' clubs, sections of ex-frontline soldiers joining me. But soon, at the same time as repressive measures and censorship restrictions intensified, submission to the Vichy authorities began to manifest itself and the drama at Mers el Kabir eliminated the last feeble attempts at resistance. In addition, it was said on the ground, not without sneaky satisfaction, that under the terms of the armistice, North Africa was not subject to occupation. The French authority remained there with all its military apparatus and pursued a rigid policy, which reassured the colonists and did not displease the Muslims. Finally, the various aspects of what the Vichy government called the National Revolution, the appeal to prominent public figures, the increased role of the administration, the parades of former frontline soldiers, the rampant anti-Semitism, all these were to many people's liking. In other words, without ceasing to hope that North Africa would one day be able to do something, people adopted a wait-and-see attitude. Nor could they hope for any internal spontaneous movement. As for the possibility of seizing power there by taking action from outside, I certainly could not count on that. Black Africa offered an entirely different opportunity. The speeches held in Dakar, St. Louis, Ouagadougou, Abidjan, Conakry, Lome, Douwa, Brazzaville, Tanana arrive in the early days of Free France, and the telegrams I received indicated that for these territories, where there was a spirit of initiative, the continuation of the war was implicit. Of course, the position of submission eventually adopted by Nogues, the unfavourable impression made by the incident at Mers el Kabir, the activities of Bussum, first Governor-General of Equatorial Africa, and then High Commissioner at Dakar, who by his ambiguous policy nullified the enthusiasm of his subjects, or cooled the patriotic fervour in Africa. In most of our colonies, however, a spark was enough to rekindle the fire. Especially favourable prospects were opening up before us in our colonial possessions in Equatorial Africa. In Cameroon, for example, the movement of protest against the armistice had reached all sections of the population. The energetic and active inhabitants of the territory, French and natives alike, resented the surrender. 
Here, moreover, they were convinced that Hitler's victory would have entailed the restoration of German domination of the territory, which had existed prior to World War I. In an atmosphere of general excitement, residents passed around leaflets in which former German colonists who had once moved to the Spanish island of Fernando P informed each other of their imminent return to their homes and plantations. I was joined by an action committee set up by Mockler, Director of Public Works. Governor General Bruno, confused in this atmosphere, refused to come over to our side. However, it was foreseeable that if decisive action was taken from the outside, the territory would join us. In the territory of Chad, the situation was even more favourable. The governor, Felix E. Buse, immediately began to act in the spirit of the resistance. This intelligent and brave man, this knave, this infinitely loyal to France, this philosopher humanist, rejected with all his being the subjugation of France and the triumphs of Nazi racism. With the appearance of my first proclamation, Zibouyi, together with his secretary general, Laurency, took our side in principle. The French population was also inclined to the same decision. Many, however, were impelled to it not only by courage, but also by reason. The military located at posts on the border with Italian Libya did not lose their fighting spirit and hoped to receive reinforcements from de Gaulle. French officials and merchants, as well as local tribal leaders, thought anxiously about the fate of the economic life of the Shadian territory if they were suddenly deprived of their natural market, British Nigeria. Alerted to this situation by Ebue himself, I telegraphed him on July 16. In reply, he sent me a detailed report. In this report, he announced his intention of formally joining Free France, outlined the conditions of defence and life of the territory which France had entrusted to his protection, and finally asked what I could do to enable him to serve under the auspices of the Cross of Lorraine. In the Congo, the situation was less clear. Governor General Boisson was at Brazzaville until the middle of July. He then moved to Dakar, but retained custody of all the territories of Equatorial Africa. He left in his place in Brazzaville General Yusson, a good soldier, but in everything guided by false considerations of discipline. It was clear that Hassan would not dare to break with the Vichy government, despite the bitterness he felt over the French defeat. In Ubangui, where many had decided to participate in the resistance movement, everything depended on the Congo's position. By contrast, in Gabon, an old colony that had pursued a conciliatory policy and had always aspired to a leading position among the other French territories of equatorial Africa. Some sections of the population were incomprehensibly cautious. Having studied the state of affairs in French Black Africa, I decided first of all to attempt to annex all the equatorial territories as soon as possible. I believed that, with the exception of Gabon, the coming operations would not require the use of large forces. Then, if this first campaign was successful, I would proceed to action in West Africa. But I realized that operations there would require a great deal of effort and considerable resources on our part. In the first stage, the difficulty was to penetrate Fort Lamp, Douala and Brazzaville simultaneously. This operation had to be carried out in one blow and immediately. For the Vichy government, which had a fleet, airplanes and troops in Dacre, and was able to use troops in Morocco and even a fleet in Toulon, had all the necessary means to intervene quickly. Admiral Plato, sent in July by Pitane and Darlan to inspect in Gabon and Cameroon, acted in the interests of Vichy, influencing local military and civilian circles. I forced the course of events. Lord Lloyd, the English Minister for the Colonies, to whom I outlined my project, understood its significance very well, especially as it related to the security of the British possessions of Nigeria, the Gold Coast, Sierra Leone and the Gambia. He gave his governors instructions in which I was interested, and on the appointed day placed an airplane at my disposal for the transportation from London to Lagos of a group of my missionaries. They were Pleven, Peran, and Etier de Boisalembert. They were to negotiate with Governor Ibu the terms of the accession of the Shadian territory to us, and to effect, with the help of Mokler and his committee, a coup d'état in Douala. Just before their departure, I was able to attach a fourth member of the mission, the future proved how useful he was. It was Captain Diot Clock. He had come from France via Spain. His head was bandaged from a wound received in Champagne, and he looked decently fatigued. When he came to introduce himself to me, I saw who I was dealing with and immediately decided where best to use him. I decided to send him to the equator. He quickly packed for the road, and under the name of Major Leclerc, having an order which I handed to the group, set out with the others. But after annexing the territories of Chad and Cameroon to the Cross of Lorraine, 
it was necessary to annex three more colonies. The Middle, Congo, Ubangi, and, and this in the first place came down to the mastery of Brazzaville, the capital of equatorial Africa, the seat of the representative of French power and its symbol. This task I entrusted to Colonel de Larmin. This brilliant and energetic officer was at that time at Cairo. At the end of June, as chief of staff of the Army of the Levant, he had tried, but without success, to persuade his commander, General Mittelhauser, to continue the struggle. He then organized the withdrawal to Palestine of the units opposed to the armistice, but Mittelhauser succeeded in bringing these units back. He was aided by General Wavell, the commander-in-chief of the British forces in the east, who feared that this move into Palestine would ultimately cause him more trouble than good. Only a few units persevered and reached the English zone. De La Mina, placed under arrest, managed to escape. He went to Djibouti, where he gave support to General Le Gentilhomme, who unsuccessfully tried to enlist French Somalia in the war, and then went to Egypt. It was in Egypt that he received my orders to proceed to Leopoldville. In the Belgian Congo, he met with the direct but cautious support of Governor General Rickman, the sympathetic attitude of the public, and finally with the active assistance of the local French, who were morally united around Dr. Staub. According to my instructions, de la Mina was to prepare throughout the Congo for the seizure of power in Brazzaville and to coordinate our actions throughout equatorial Africa. When everything was ready, de la Mina, Pleven, Leclerc, Boise Lambert and Major Dornano, who had come specially from the territory of Chad, assembled at Lagos. Sir Bernard Bordillon, Governor-General of Nigeria, gave the free Frenchman vigorous and able support. It was agreed that the territory of Chad would be joined first, Douala the next day, and Brazzaville the day after that. On August 26 at Fort Lamb, Governor Ebuyu and Colonel Marchand, commander of the troops of the territory of Chad, solemnly proclaimed its accession to General de Gaulle. Pleven arrived there immediately by plane to authorise this decision on my behalf. I myself reported the event on the London radio and noted Chad in an order on the French Empire. On August 27, Leclerc and Boise Lambert brilliantly carried out the intended operation in Cameroon. Meanwhile, they had negligible means at their disposal. At first, I had hoped to place a military unit at their disposal to facilitate their task. The fact is that we found in a military camp in England a thousand black soldiers sent from the Ivory Coast during the Battle of France to reinforce the colonial units. They arrived too late and were in England awaiting repatriation. I had arranged with the English that this unit would go to Accra, where Major Parron would take command of it. It could be assumed that the return of these units to their homeland in Africa would not alarm the Vichy government. They were landed on the Gold Coast. These soldiers made such a great impression with their dressing that the British officers did not escape the temptation to include them in their troops. Leclerc and Boise Lambert thus had at their disposal only a handful of military men and a few colonists who had escaped from Douala. But the moment they were leaving Victoria, General Gifford, the English commander-in-chief, suddenly frightened at the consequences of the operation conceived, forbade its execution, in full agreement with me, who telegraphed to them that they were to proceed at their own risk. They disobeyed the English general's prohibition, and by the assistance of the Victorian English they succeeded in going by pyrogues to Douala. The little detachment arrived at Douala by night. De Gaulle's men, who appeared at the first signal to Dr. Mose, met the detachment as arranged. Leclerc, who had become, as if by magic, colonel and governor, occupied the government palace without difficulty. The next day, accompanied by two companies of the Douala garrison, he arrived by train at Yaoundé, where the authorities were stationed. The transfer of authority was painless. In Brazzaville, the operation was also successful. On August 28, at the appointed hour, Major Delange, at the head of his battalion, went to the government palace and offered Governor-General Yusen to give up his seat. Though not without protest, Yusen yielded without resistance. The garrison, the officials, the colonists and the natives, whose sympathies had even before been on our side under the influence of General of the Medical Service size, Intendant Souk, Colonel of Artillery Series, Lieutenant Colonel of Aviation Caratea, greeted what had happened with joy. General de la Mina, who was making the Congo tour, immediately assumed on my behalf the functions of High Commissioner of French Equatorial Africa, with civil and military powers. The vessel in which he arrived returned to Leopoldville with General Hassan on board. As for Ubangi, Governor de Saint Map, who was entirely on our side, telegraphed his accession immediately after hearing of the events at Brazzaville. 
However, the commander of the troops and some of the military units huddled in the barracks, threatening to open fire on the town. But La Mina flew immediately by airplane to Bangui and reassured these sincerely misguided men. Nevertheless, several officers were isolated from the general mass and sent to West Africa at their request. Thus, the greater part of the territories of equatorial Africa were annexed to free France, without a single drop of blood being shed. Only Gabon remained detached. However, it did not take much effort to annex this colony as well. On August 29, Governor Msoy, who had been informed by Lamina of the change of power, telegraphed me from Libreville of his accession. At the same time, he publicly announced the annexation of the Gabon territory to Free France and notified the commander of the troops. But in Dakar, the Vichy authorities acted decisively. At their behest, the naval commander in Libreville, who had one messenger ship and one submarine and several small craft, confronted the governor and announced the arrival of the squadron. Masson then changed his position and declared that the accession of Gabon to Free France was the result of a misunderstanding. Naval aviation plane, flying between Libreville and Dakar, took out to West Africa prominent figures and delivered to Gabon supporters of the Vichy government. The situation has changed dramatically. In our territories of equatorial Africa, an area hostile to us, which was difficult to seize because it had access to the sea, the Vichy government, in order to take advantage of the situation, appointed the Governor-General of Equatorial Africa, General Tetu, who was given the task of establishing his authority everywhere. At the same time, a number of Glen Martin bombers landed at the airfield, and General Tetu declared that this was only the vanguard to be followed by the main force. On the whole, however, the results were favourable to us, and I hoped that the second part of the plan, the annexation of Black Africa, would also be successfully carried out. In truth, this new phase of the struggle seemed more difficult. The power in West Africa was strongly centralised, and moreover, its representatives were closely connected with the French leadership in North Africa. There were considerable military forces there. A formidable bastion was the fortress of Dakar. It had good armament, strong fortifications, modern artillery guns, had several aviation squadrons, served as a base for the squadron, particularly for submarines, as well as for the powerful battleship Richie Liu, whose command staff was eager for revenge after the attack of the British when their torpedoes damaged the ship. Finally, Governor General Boyson was a man of vigour, whose inordinate ambition, which exceeded common sense, led him to defend the interests of Vichy. He proved this soon after his arrival at Dakar, in the middle of July, by imprisoning Louveau, the chief administrator of the territory of Upper Volta, who had declared its succession to free France. I did not have sufficient means to take Dakar by storm. On the other hand, I felt it absolutely necessary to avoid a major clash. This did not mean that I was under any illusions as to the possibility of achieving the liberation of the country without the fratricidal shedding of French blood. But at that moment, and in that territory, a major battle launched by us, regardless of its outcome, would have greatly diminished our chances of success. It is impossible to understand the Dakar operation without these considerations guiding me. So my original plan rejected a direct attack. It planned a landing at a great distance from Dakar of a select detachment which was to move toward the objective, annexing territory along the way and attracting military units to its side. It was thus hoped that the forces of Free France, increased by such a campaign, would approach Dakar from the land. I intended to land the troops at Conakry. From there it was possible to move to the capital of West Africa, using the railroad and direct road linking Conakry with Dakar. But in order to prevent the Dakar squadron from destroying our expeditionary force, it was necessary to cover it from the sea. I had to ask the English Navy to do this. In the last days of July, I informed Churchill of this plan. At first, he did not tell me anything positive, but sometime later invited me to his house. I found him on August 6, as usual, in that large room in Downing Street, which by tradition is both the Prime Minister's office and the meeting room of His Majesty's government. On the huge table that occupied most of the room lay unfolded maps, Churchill paced back and forth, talking animatedly. It is necessary, he said to me, that we take possession of Dakar together. This is extremely important for you because if the operation ends successfully, in the war will take part in the large forces of France. It is also very important for us because the possibility of using Dakar as a naval base would greatly ease our position in the heavy battle in the Atlantic. Therefore, having consulted on this matter with the Maritime Ministry and the Chiefs of Staff, 
I can inform you that we are ready to support the expedition. We envisage using a large naval squadron for this purpose, but we could not keep it long off the coast of Africa, as we are compelled to use this squadron again to cover England and also for our operations in the Mediterranean. That is why we do not agree with your project of landing troops at Conakry and moving them slowly through the wooded areas. It would force us to keep ships for months off these shores. I want to suggest to you something different. And Churchill, studying his speech with the most expressive intonations, began to paint me the following picture. One morning the people of Dakar wake up in a sad and depressed mood, and then they see in the rays of the rising sun, far out to sea, a multitude of ships, a huge fleet, hundreds of warships or cargo ships, the ships are slowly approaching, radioing friendly messages to the city, the navy and the garrison. Some ships are flying the tricolour flag. Others go under British, Dutch, Polish, Belgian flags. From this allied squadron separates an innocuous little boat with the white flag of the parliamentarians. It enters the harbour and General de Gaulle's envoys disembark from it. They are taken to the governor, to whom it will be necessary to explain that if he allows the French to come ashore, the allied fleet will leave and it will only remain to settle with him the question of the terms of his cooperation with you. But if he wants to fight, he will surely be defeated. And Churchill with great conviction began, gesticulating, drawing scenes of future events as they were born of his imagination and desire. During this conversation between the governor and your representatives, free French and British planes are flying peacefully over the city, scattering friendly leaflets. The people of the city, military and civilian, among whom your agents are active, are hotly discussing the merits of an agreement with you, and the inexpediency of a great battle against those who are, moreover, allied with France. The governor realises that if he resists, the ground will be taken from under his feet. You will find that he will continue negotiations until they are successfully concluded. He may be willing to fire a few cannon shots to save his honour, but it will go no further than that and tonight he will dine with you and drink to the final victory. Putting aside the seductive embellishments that could be attributed to Churchill's eloquence, I concluded after some reflection that his plan rested on solid ground, in view of the fact that the British could not keep a large naval force around the equator for long, I could only capture Descartes by direct and decisive action, but if this operation did not culminate in a real battle, it would inevitably entail a combination of persuasion and threats. On the other hand, Dakar, a major Atlantic base where the battleship Richelieu was located, caused the British Maritime Ministry both anxiety and desire to seize it. I considered it probable that sooner or later the English would try, either with the free French or on their own, to settle the question. I concluded that if we took part in this operation, we had a good chance that it would lead to the annexation of Dakar to free France. If, on the contrary, we refused to take part in it, the British will sooner or later carry out this operation in their own interests. 13. In this case, Dakar will be stubbornly defended, using fortress, guns and artillery richly you, and the entire armada of transports will be subjected to the strikes of bombers Glen Martin, fighters Curtis, and submarines, extremely dangerous to ships, which at that time did not have any means of radar, and if even Dakar, destroyed by shells, would eventually be forced to surrender to the British, the operation would be detrimental to French sovereignty. Soon I visited Churchill and informed him that I accept his proposal. I developed a plan of action with Admiral Andrew Cunningham, who was to command the British squadron. During this difficult operation I found in him a comrade in arms, though not always pleasant, but an excellent sailor and a cordial man. At the same time I was preparing the means that we French could use in the operation. These were three messenger ships the Savornian de Brazza, the Commando Duboc, the Commando de Mine, and two armed trawlers, the Valent and the Viking. On board the two Dutch steamers Penland and Westerland were a battalion of the Foreign Legion, a company of recruits, a company of marines, personnel of a tank company and an artillery battery, as well as some auxiliary units. A total of 2,000 men. Our forces also included pilots from two squadrons. And finally, four French cargo ships. Anadir, Casamance, Fort Lamy, Nevada with machine tools, guns, aircraft such as Lysander, Hurricane and Blanheim in disassembled form, various vehicles, as well as material supplies. As for the British, their squadron did not include all the ships that Churchill had initially mentioned. In its final form, it consisted of two battleships of obsolete design. 
Balm and Resolution, four cruisers, aircraft carrier Arch Royal, several destroyers and one tanker. In addition, three transports were to bring two battalions of marines with landing craft under Brigadier General Irwin. But the question of the Polish brigade, which at the outset was announced that it would take part in the operation, was dropped. It seemed that the British staff, less than the Prime Minister, believed in the importance or success of the operation, cut back the funds originally planned. A few days before departure, the British initiated a fierce discussion on the question of what I would do in the event of a successful outcome of the operation with the large stockpile of gold held in Bamako. It was gold deposited with the Banque de France. Some of it belonged to the Belgian and Polish state banks. The gold reserves of the Banque de France were indeed, at the time of the German invasion, partly taken to Senegal. Another part of it was hidden in the vaults of the American Federal Bank, and the remainder was sent to Martinique. Despite blockades, borders and guard posts, the Bamako gold was closely watched by the intelligence services of the warring parties. The Belgians and Poles expressed a legitimate desire that their share should be returned to them, and I gave Spark as well as Zaleski assurances to that effect. But the British, who naturally had no right to this gold, nevertheless intended to use it for the purpose of paying for their purchases in America, pleading that they were doing so in the interest of the coalition. At that time, indeed, the US was not selling anything on credit to anyone, despite the insistence of Spears, who even threatened to refuse the British participation in the intended operation. I firmly rejected this demand. In the end, it was decided as I had proposed at first, that is, that the French gold at Bamako would be used only to pay for those purchases to be made by England in America for fighting France. Just before our departure came the news of the annexation of the territory of Chad, Cameroon, Congo, and Ubangi. This news lifted our spirits. Even if we had not succeeded in capturing Dakar, we could now, thanks to reinforcements, hope to establish a sovereign territorial base of operations for fighting France in Central Africa. The expedition sailed from Liverpool on August 31st. I was with part of the French forces and a part-time staff on board the Westerland, sailing under French and Dutch flags. The commanding officer of the Westerland, Captain Plaguet, the officers and crew, as well as the officers and crew of the Penland, showed during the voyage high examples of friendship and self-sacrifice. I was accompanied by Spears, to whom Churchill had entrusted the duties of liaison officer, diplomat and informer. In England I entrusted the command of our forming forces to Muselier. Antoine was in charge of our fledgling administrative organs. De Vavrin was to keep in direct communication with us and keep us informed. In addition, General Catru, returning from French into China, was expected in England shortly. I therefore informed him, in a letter to be handed to him on his arrival, of all my plans as well as my intentions in regard to his mission. I expected that, in spite of my absence, and especially if it were not prolonged, my assistants, who had accumulated considerable experience, would not allow internal quarrels and external intrigues to undermine the foundations of our edifice, which was still so fragile. But standing on the deck of the Westerland after the expedition left the port at the moment of the raid of any bombers, I thought about my small group, about my little boats and felt on my shoulders the immense weight of the responsibility taken upon myself. Swaying on the ocean waves among the boundless expanse of water in the darkness, a small foreign ship, without guns, with extinguished lights, was taking with her the fate of France. Our first destination was Freetown. The plan was to regroup our forces here and get the latest information. We arrived in Freetown only on September 17 because our cargo ships had little speed and in addition made a decent detour to avoid meeting with German planes and submarines. During the crossing, radiograms received from London conveyed a message that could overturn all our plans. It was about the Vichy naval forces. September 11, three heavy modern cruisers George's Laig, Gluer, Montcalm and three light cruisers Odysseer Fantasque, Marlin, leaving Toulon, passed through the Strait of Gibraltar, not meeting the opposition of the British Navy. Having passed Casablanca, they reached Dakar. But hardly had we anchored at Freetown, as a new alarming news further increased our excitement. The squadron, reinforced at Dakar by the cruiser Primoge, had just dropped anchor and was moving off at full speed in a southerly direction. An English destroyer, assigned for observation, followed her at a distance. I had no doubt that this large naval force was on its way to equatorial Africa, where it could freely enter the port of Libreville and could easily retake Pointe Noir and Douala. Even if the sudden appearance of this formidable squadron 
would not be enough to restore the former situation in the Congo and Cameroon. These excellent ships could easily cover the transfer and landing of punitive units sent from Dakar, Conakry, or Abidjan. However, this assumption was almost immediately confirmed when the cargo ship Poitiers, sailing from Dakar to Libreville, was sunk by order of its commander after being stopped by the British. It was clear that the Vichy government was plotting a major operation to regain the territories annexed to free France, and that the sending of seven cruisers into equatorial waters could only have occurred with the full consent, if not by order, of the Germans. Admiral Cunningham agreed with me that it was necessary to stop the Vichy squadron at once. We agreed that this unexpectedly, unexpectedly appeared squadron will be asked to head not to Dakar, but to Casablanca. In case of refusal, the British squadron will begin hostilities. However, we hoped that one threat would be enough for these misled ships to turn back. After all, if the British ships, which had a much slower speed, could not intercept the ships of Vichy. But the double superiority in armament provided the British with an advantage over the Vichy fleet in case he had to seek refuge in the raid of any equatorial port, not protected by coastal artillery. Consequently, the aggressor had to either withdraw or take the fight in the worst conditions for him. It seemed unlikely that the Vichy squadron commander would make the latter decision. And indeed, the captains of the British cruisers, having contacted Admiral Burrage, commander of a squadron that had appeared at the wrong time, easily succeeded in getting that squadron to turn back as soon as its commander, to his utter amazement, learned that there was a French-English fleet nearby. But the Vichy ships, without fear of pursuit, were not headed for Casablanca, but for Only the cruisers Glua and Primoge, going slow because of a breakdown in the engine room, obeyed the demand and arrived in Casablanca, rejecting my offer to repair the damage in Freetown. This decision they took after Captain Thierry d'Argent Liu, second rank Captain Thierry d'Argent Liu, who was on the destroyer Ingerfield, entered into negotiations with them at my direction. Thus, free French Africa escaped a great danger. This fact alone fully justified the expedition we had prepared. On the other hand, the behaviour of the Toulon squadron, which marched to the equator in the belief that we were not there, and then abandoned its plan as soon as it discovered our fleet there, showed that the Vichy government was not aware of the route of our expedition. We could thus congratulate ourselves on having succeeded in frustrating the plans of our adversaries. But at the same time, we had to recognise that the execution of our own plans was now threatened. Indeed, the authorities at Dakar were alert, and, moreover, strong warships had arrived at Dakar to assist them. Our agents soon reported that the colonial artillerymen manning the shore batteries had been found insufficiently reliable and had been replaced by marine artillerymen. In short, our chances of occupying Dakar were now greatly diminished. In London, Churchill and the Maritime Ministry believed that under the circumstances, the most appropriate would be to abandon the planned operation. They telegraphed us on September 16, suggesting that the British Navy escorted our transports only to Douala and then leave the area. I must say that the abandonment of the operation seemed to me a most unfortunate solution of the question. Indeed, if we do not make an attempt to change the situation in Dakar, the Vichy government will resume its actions against equatorial Africa immediately after the British ships leave in a northerly direction. And since the sea route will be free, the cruisers under Burridge will again rush into equatorial waters. And then the French, fighting under the shadow of the Cross of Lorraine with General de Gaulle, will sooner or later be isolated in these remote territories, if by then they have not perished in a fruitless struggle with their countrymen in the jungles of the rainforest. In doing so, they would be deprived of the opportunity to fight the Germans and Italians. I had no doubt that such were the intentions of the enemy whose will, consciously or unconsciously, was carried out by the obedient Vichy statists. I believe that in the current state of affairs, we must, no matter what, try to penetrate into deck. However, I must admit that the already accomplished accession to us, a number of territories in Africa, gave me a secret hope. This hope was further strengthened by the good news that came from other places after our departure from London. On September 2, the French possessions in Ogerania, governed by a provisional government composed of Aina, Lagarde, and Martin, joined Free France. On September 9, Governor Bonvin announced that the French possessions in India had joined. On September 14, at St. Pierre and Miquelon, a general assembly of ex frontiers sent word of their decision to join me. Thereupon, the English government asked the Canadian government to support their movement. On September 20, Governor Soto, 
who had annexed the new Hebrides to us on July 818, arrived at Numia on my orders. The Comite de Gaulle, which existed there, under the chairmanship of Michael Verge, with the energetic support of the population, became master of the situation, and this enabled Soto to take power. Finally, I witnessed Barrage's squadron turn back at short notice, who could assert that we would not, even in Dakar, meet with a spirit of agreement which would sideline the execution of the most categorical orders. At any rate, we should have tried. Admiral Cunningham was of the same opinion. We telegraphed to London, making an insistent request that we should be allowed to carry out the operation. Churchill, as he told me of it afterward, was surprised but also delighted at our persistence. He readily gave his consent and the operation was authorised. Before leaving, however, I had a sharp confrontation with Cunningham. Taking advantage of my dependent position, Cunningham intended to subjugate me and the small force at my disposal. In return, he offered me a position on his flagship battleship Barham. Of course, I declined both his demand and his invitation. That same evening, a major conversation took place aboard the Westerland. And during the night, the Admiral sent me an exceptionally kind note in which he waived his demands. On September 21, we raised anchor and at dawn on September 23, in a dense fog, we were already approaching Dakar. The fog seriously interfered with our operation. In particular, the moral effect, which, according to Churchill, could have our fleet on the garrison and the population, could not now be counted on, because it was not visible. But the operation could not be postponed, so we proceeded to carry out the plan. At six o'clock, I addressed by radio to the naval forces, troops and population, announcing to them our arrival and our friendly intentions. Immediately thereafter, two small unarmed La Laolas, French tourist planes, took to the air from the takeoff deck of the aircraft carrier Arch Royal to land at Huacam airfield and drop off three officers, Guy, Scamaroni, and Soflit. They were charged with the task of organizing a fraternization. I soon learned that the Laleoli had landed safely and that a banner with the signal success had been unfurled at the airfield. Suddenly, at various points, the air defense opened fire. The anti-aircraft guns of the Richelieu and the fortress began to bombard the airplanes of the free French and British who were flying over the city, scattering leaflets with a friendly appeal. However, as ominous as this cannonade was, it seemed to me that there was something insecure about it. I therefore ordered two boats with parliamentarians to enter the harbour, while the messenger vessels of the free French and the steamers Westerland and Penland were approaching the entrance to the raid in the fog. It has at first no retaliation was made. Captain Second Rank Dargent Liu, Major Gorchut, Captains Bicourt Fox and Perrin, and Lieutenant Junior Lieutenant Porges ordered their boats moored, went down to the wharf, and demanded the harbour. When he appeared, Dargent Liu told him that he had a letter from General de Gaulle addressed to the Governor General, which he must place in his own hands. But the harbour master, without concealing his embarrassment, told the parliamentarians that he had orders to arrest them. At the same time, he manifested his intention of calling out the guard. Seeing this, my messengers returned to their boats. As the gunboats were leaving, machine gun fire was opened upon them. Dargent Liu and Perrin, seriously wounded, were taken on board the Westerland. Following this, the shore batteries of Dakar opened a cursory fire on the English and free French ships. For several hours, we did not return the fire. Richelieu, which had been taken in tugs to port to make more efficient use of her guns, also opened fire. By 11 o'clock, after the cruiser Cumberland had been badly damaged, Admiral Cunningham sent the following radiogram to the fortress. I am not firing at you. Why are you firing at me? The reply re, retreat to a distance of 20 miles. Thereupon the British in turn fired several volleys. Time passed, however, but no really belligerent mood was manifested on either side. Until the middle of the day in the air did not rise in the Vichy airplane. All these facts, in my opinion, did not indicate that the fortress was ready to put up a fierce resistance. Could it be that the fleet, the garrison, and the governor were waiting for some event which might serve as a pretext for reconciliation? By noon, Admiral Cunningham sent me a telegram informing me that he was of the same opinion. Of course, bringing a squadron into port was out of the question, but could it not be possible to land the free French near the fortress, which they would then try to approach from the land? Such an option had been envisaged even earlier. The small port of Rufisque, out of reach of the fortress artillery fire, seemed suitable for this operation, of course, 
if the participants in the operation would not meet with determined resistance there. The fact is that while our ships could approach Rufisk, the transports were unable to do so because of the deep landing. It became necessary to land our troops using dinghies. In this case, the troops would not be able to take heavy weapons with them. Thus, the success of the affair depended upon a complete quiescence in this section. Having, however, received an assurance from Cunningham that he would provide us with cover from the sea, I directed all our forces towards Rufisk. By 3 p.m., we arrived at our destination. There was still a thick fog. Commandant Dubok, with a platoon of marines on board, entered the harbour and sent a dinghy with a few sailors to the shore to dock the vessel. On the shore, a crowd of natives had already fled to meet them, but at that time the Vichy troops, who were taking up positions in the vicinity, opened fire on our vessel, killing and wounding several men. A few minutes before, two Glen Martin bombers had flown at a low altitude over our little detachment, as if intending to show that it was in full possession of them, and so in fact it was. At last Admiral Cunningham telegraphed that the cruisers Gorges, Lega and Montcalm, which had left the Dakar raid, were one mile from us in the fog, and that the British ships engaged elsewhere could not cover us. Yes, the operation was lost. Not only was it impossible to land, but only a few gunshots fired by the Vichy cruisers were enough to send the whole Free France expedition to the bottom. I decided to put to sea, which was done without incident. The night passed in suspense. The next day the command of the British fleet, having received a telegram from Churchill with orders to actively continue the operation, sent an ultimatum to the authorities of Dakar. A reply followed that the fortress would not be surrendered. Then the British in the fog, which has become particularly thick, led at random hot gun fire with coastal batteries and with the ships on the roadstead. By the end of the day, it was clear that no decisive result could be achieved. When evening came, the battleship Barham approached Westerland and Admiral Cunningham asked me to join him to discuss the situation. There was a sad and tense mood aboard the British battleship. Certainly there was regret here for the failure to succeed, but a feeling of surprise prevailed. The English practical men could not understand the reason why the authorities' navy and troops of Dakar were fighting with such fierceness with their countrymen and allies, while France was under the heel of the invaders. As for me, I resolved henceforth not to be surprised at anything. Recent events have finally convinced me that the Viki rulers will never stop before using the courage and discipline of their subordinates to the detriment of French interests. Admiral Cunningham reported on the situation. Considering the mood of the fortress and the squadron supporting it, he stated, I do not think a bombardment can produce the desired result. Brigadier General Irwin, commander of the landing parties, added that he was prepared to put his forces ashore to attack the fortifications, but it should be clearly understood what a tremendous risk every ship and every soldier would run. Both asked me what would become of the Free France if the expedition were to end there. Up to the present time, I replied, we have made no decisive attack on Dakar. The attempt to occupy the fortress by peaceful means has not succeeded. Artillery bombardment will solve nothing. The landing of the troops and the attack on the fortifications entailed a real battle. But I want to avoid a battle of which you yourself say the outcome is highly doubtful. Consequently, for the we must abandon the idea of taking Dakar. I suggest that Admiral Cunningham announce that he is ceasing the shelling at the request of General de Gaulle, but the blockade should not be lifted lest the ships at Dakar be given free reign. In the future, we will have to make a new attempt to seize Dakar, moving to the fortress from the land after landing in unprotected or poorly defended points, such as St. Louis. In any case and under any circumstances, free France will not stop fighting. The English Admiral and General joined my opinion as to our action in the near future. It was already nightfall when I set sail from the Barham in a dinghy bobbing on the waves. The officers and crew of the ship, lined up at the rail, sadly paid me the set on us. But the bottom events that occurred during the night forced Admiral Cunningham to abandon what he and I had agreed upon. First, a telegram was received from Churchill with orders to proceed with the operation. Churchill, judging by the telegram, was surprised and annoyed by the sudden termination of the operation, especially since the political circles in London, and especially Washington, were influenced by radio broadcasts from Vichy and Berlin and they began to show concern. Secondly, the fog cleared and the bombing could now bring the desired results. So, at dawn, there was an artillery exchange between the fortress and the British fleet, and the battle resumed. This time, no one asked my opinion. 
but towards evening the battleship Resolution, which had been torpedoed by a submarine, had to be taken in tow, for she might have sunk. Several other British ships were also badly damaged. Four airplanes from the Arch Royal were shot down. The enemy's Richelieu and other ships were badly damaged. Light cruiser Audacia, submarines Perseus and Ajax were sunk, with the crew of the submarine Ajax was picked up by a British destroyer. But the fortress forts continued to fire. Admiral Cunningham determined to avoid further losses. I acceded to his decision, for I had no other choice. We set course for Freetown. For me, the days were hard. I was experiencing what a man might experience when an earthquake shakes his house violently and shingles fall from the roof in hail. A storm of anger in London and a hurricane of sarcasm in Washington came upon me. The American press and many English newspapers immediately laid the blame for the failure of the operation on General de Gaulle. It was he, said the newspapers, invented this ridiculous adventure, misled the British with his fantastic information about the situation in Dakar, demanded out of Don Kikotsky motives that the fortress was attacked at a time when reinforcements sent by Darlin made any success impossible moreover. The cruisers from Toulon arrived thanks to the chattering of many free Frenchmen who thus warned the Vichy government. Is it not clear that one cannot trust men who cannot keep a secret? Soon it came to Churchill, who was reproached for allowing himself to be so easily persuaded. Spears, with a lean expression on his face, brought me telegrams of an informational nature received from his correspondence, which reported that, apparently, de Gaulle, desperate, abandoned by his supporters, abandoned by the British at the mercy of fate, will give up all activity, and that the British government will resume, with the help of Catru or Muselier, on a much more modest scale recruitment of auxiliary French forces. As for the Vichy propaganda, it did not conceal its exultation. Judging from the reports coming from Dakar, one would have thought that it was a major victory won at sea. In the newspapers of both zones and in the radio broadcasts on the so-called French, waves there appeared, accompanied by commentaries. Countless congratulatory telegrams addressed to Governor-General Boisson and to the heroic defenders of Dakar. In the meantime, in my cramped quarters, on a raid of unbearable heat, I had finally come to realise what a reaction of fear is, both in enemies avenging what they have experienced and in allies suddenly frightened by defeat. Meanwhile, I very soon became convinced that, despite the setback, the free French remain undeterred. In all the units of our expedition where I visited immediately after we dropped anchor, I did not meet a single person who wanted to leave me. On the contrary, their determination was further strengthened by the hostile attitude of Vichy. Thus, when an airplane from Dakar flew over our ships at anchor, it was met with furious firing, something that would not have happened a week before. I soon learned from the friendly telegrams which I received from Delamin and Leclerc that they themselves, and those around them, were as full of unswerving loyalty as ever. London has not changed its attitude towards us, in spite of the hail of barbs that have been hurled at us. This confidence of those who were associated with me was a great encouragement to me. So free France had a solid foundation. So it's hurt. Let's keep fighting. Spears, a little calmer, quoted Victor Hugo to me. The next day Emery took the sit. It must be said that if in London many people treated us with dislike, the government, on the contrary, kept its good feelings. Churchill, attacked, did not disown me, just as I did not disown him. On September 28, he made in the House of Commons a report of events as objectively as could be expected of him, and declared that all that has happened has only increased the confidence of His Majesty's government in General de Gaulle. It is true that at that moment the Prime Minister already knew, though he did not wish to say so, how the squadron which had left Toulon had been able to pass through the Straits of Gibraltar. He himself told me about it when I returned to England two months later. A telegram sent from Tangier by Captain Louise, a French intelligence officer who had secretly defected to the Free French side, gave London and Gibraltar intelligence of the movements of the Vichy ships. But this telegram came at a time when the bombardment of Whitehall by German planes forced the staff into the bomb shelter for many hours, disrupting the headquarters for long periods of time. The telegram was deciphered too late and Sea Lord failed to alert the Gibraltar fleet at the right moment. More to the point, despite the fact that the naval attack of the Vichy government in Madrid, in a burst of frankness, had himself warned the British attach about it, and thus the commander of the Gibraltar naval base was aware of it from two different sources. Nothing was done to stop these ships. 
However, the Prime Minister's official stance on the Degelews did much to quieten Parliament and the newspapers. Nevertheless, the operation in Dakar forever left a painful trace in the hearts of the British. And the Americans came to the conclusion that if they ever have to land in the territory under the Vichy government, the operation should be carried out without the participation of the Free French and British. At any rate, in the near future, our English allies were opposed to the renewal of this attempt. Admiral Cunningham told me emphatically that the resumption of the operation in any form should be refused. He himself could only escort me to Cameroon. We set a course for Douala. On October 8, just as the French transports were entering the mouth of the Wuri River, the British ships saluted and sailed into the open sea. When the messenger ship Commando Duboc, on board of which I was on board during the voyage, entered the port of Douala, the population of the city was overwhelmed with exceptional enthusiasm. I was met at the port by Leclerc. After a review of the troops, I proceeded to the government palace. While in the port, the units arriving from England were landing. The servants, French colonists and prominent natives with whom I had established contact, were vigorously expressing their patriotic sentiments. They did not, however, forget their local needs. It was primarily a question of securing the exportation of their produce and the importation of vital goods not available in the territory. But in spite of the concerns and differences, what was immediately apparent was the moral unity of the free French, both those who had joined me in London and those who had joined me in Africa. This moral unity of all free Frenchmen who had come under the shadow of the cross of Lorraine became afterwards a permanent factor in our movement. Henceforth it was possible to foresee, so to speak, for certain, the way of thinking and behaviour of the Degolais wherever they were and whatever happened to them. Thus, for example, the enthusiastic enthusiasm which I had just witnessed, I always met afterwards in any situation where the masses of people were present. I must say that the thought of this never left me for a moment. I embodied for my associates the fate of our cause, for many Frenchmen the hope, for foreigners the image of unconquered France in the midst of its ordeal, and all this conditioned my behaviour and showed me a path from which I could not leave. It encouraged me to exercise constant and rigorous self-control, and at the same time imposed on me a great responsibility. At this moment it was a question of securing the lives of all the French territories of equatorial Africa and involving them in the battle for Africa. I had intended to create a Saharan theatre of war on the border between Chad and Libya in anticipation of the day when the course of events would enable a column of French troops to seize Fezzan and then reach the Mediterranean. But the conditions of the desert and the unheard of difficulties in communication and supply made it possible to use for this purpose only a limited and special military force. I therefore wanted to send an expeditionary corps to the Middle East at the same time, which would join the British there. The ultimate goal for all was French North Africa. First, however, it was necessary to eliminate the hostile locus in Gabon. On October 12 at Douale, I gave the appropriate orders. While this difficult operation was being prepared, I left Cameroon to visit other territories. After a brief stay in Yadi, I headed first for the territory of Chad. The career of the head of Free France and his entourage was almost cut short on that trip. As the Potes 540 aircraft we were flying to Fort Lamp suffered engine failure, and only by a miracle did we manage to land without major damage in a swampy area. There was great excitement in the Chad area. Everyone felt as if a ray of history had just illuminated this heroic and long-suffering land. Of course, nothing could be done here without effort. This was due to a number of unfavourable factors. Distance, isolation, climate, lack of funds. But the heroic mood that gives rise to great deeds was already emerging here. Libya received me at Fort Lamy. I felt that I would always receive his support and loyalty, at the same time I found that he possessed a mind broad enough to understand the vast plans to which I wished to engage him. He never raised any objection to our arrangements or to the risks involved. In the meantime, the governor had nothing less than a great deal of work to do in the way of communications to enable Chad to receive from Brazzaville, Douar, Lagos and thence to the frontiers of Italian Libya the arms and equipment which the free French forces would need for active warfare. It was a matter of 6,000 kilometres of tracks to be laid or maintained by the population of the Chadian territory. In addition, there would be a need to develop the area's economy to feed the troops and workers, as well as provide exports to cover costs. This task was further complicated by the fact that many colonists and employees were subject to mobilisation, together with Colonel Marchand. 
commander of the troops of the Chad territory, I flew to the area of Faya and the posts located D, in the desert. The troops there were determined but badly in need of arms. Of the mobile assets there, there were only native units on camels and a few vehicle platoons. So when I told the officers that I was counting on their help in order to one day seize Fezzan and reach the Mediterranean Sea, I read on their faces deep amazement. German and Italian raids, which they would have to repel with great difficulty, seemed to them much more probable than the prospect I had indicated of a long-range advance of French troops. They all, however, expressed their determination to continue the war, and thus the flag with the cross of Lorraine was everywhere hoisted. To the west, however, in the territories of the Niger and the Saharan Oses, the comrades of these officers, who were also stationed at posts near the frontier with Libya, but who had no superior in the spheres of command who dared to break this torpor, who were ready to shoot anyone who tried to entice them to fight the enemies of France. Of all the moral trials which fell to my lot in connection with the criminal errors of Vichy, the heaviest was the contemplation of this senseless stagnation. But when I returned to Fort Lamy, I received an encouraging encouragement. It was given me by General Ka When he arrived in London after my departure for Africa, experts in recognising the secret intentions of others believed that the British would try to replace de Gaulle this general, accustomed to the activity of large posts, while pedantic opportunists wondered whether Catru agreed to take over from an ordinary brigadier general. Ketru met with Churchill on several occasions, and many people spread rumours about these talks, during which the Prime Minister apparently did offer him to take my place, not, of course, for the General to agree to it, but guided by the classic saying, divide and conquer. A few days before the Dakar operation, Churchill suddenly telegraphed me that he was sending Katra in Cairo in order to influence the Levant, where it was expected the emergence of a favourable situation. I made my views clear in this regard saying that I saw nothing wrong in this intention, but still believe that beforehand should have secured my consent. Churchill then gave a satisfactory answer, citing the extreme necessity of such an undertaking. And so Catru arrived from Cairo. I raised my glass at dinner in honour of this distinguished military leader, to whom I had long felt a sense of respectful friendship. Catru's reply was noble and simple. He said that he was coming under my command, Abu and all present realised with excitement that henceforth, for Catru de Gaulle was above rank and title, because he was entrusted with a mission that transcended the hierarchy of office. The enormous significance of Catru's act cannot be minimised. When, having agreed with General Catru on the objectives of his mission, I bade him farewell at the plane on which he was to return to Cairo, I felt how much higher he had become. In Brazzaville, where I arrived on October 24, the population and the authorities in general were as steadfast as in Duela and Fort Lamy, but they were very calm, which was natural for a capital. The administration, the staff, the institutions, the business community, the missionaries were aware of the difficulties which the equatorial territories, the poorest in the whole French Empire, ought to overcome in order to be able to exist during the period of detachment from the metropolis and to bear the burden of military expenses. In truth, some of their products, oil, rubber, timber, cotton, coffee, leather could easily have been sold to the British and Americans, but in view of the absence of factories and of minerals, with the exception of small reserves of gold, exports could not support the purchases that had to be made abroad. In order to assist Larmin in this endeavour, I appointed Pleven as General Secretary. Putting the machine in motion, Pleven was to go to London and Washington to settle questions as to payments and terms. His abilities and the support of Larmin proved of great service to us. The administrators, planters, merchants, forwarders, seeing that there was much to be done and that the game was worth the candle, launched an intense activity which, even during the war, had profoundly transformed the life of the territories of equatorial Africa. My trip at the end of October to Ubangi, where I met Governor St. Ma, and then to Point in Noir, where Dagan was administrator, caused a general upsurge there. Finally, on October 27, I went to Leopoldville, where the authorities, the troops, the population, and the French living in the Belgian Congo gave me an exciting meeting. Governor General Rickman, also detached from his native land, wished, however, that his country should take part in the war, and sympathised with Free France. Free France, however, defended the Belgian Congo against the spirit of surrender, which had almost penetrated it from the north. Rickman maintained close ties with his French neighbour on the other side of the Congo until the very end. It should be noted that their English counterparts, 
Bordillon in Nigeria and Huddleston in the Sudan did the same. Instead of the rivalries and intrigues that once turned neighbours against each other, a personal solidarity developed between the governors of Lagos, Douala, Brazzaville, Leopoldville and Khartoum, which played no small part in the war effort and in the maintenance of proper order in Africa. Meanwhile, everything was ready for the completion of the operation in Gabon. Before my arrival in Douala, Lamina had already taken the first measures. Several units under the command of Major Peran, who had come from the Congo, had approached Lamborine, situated on the banks of the Ogo, but they were forced to halt, meeting the resistance of the Vichy troops. At the same time, a small column of troops sent from Cameroon under the command of Captain Dio surrounded the post of Mitsik. At Lamboran and Mitsik, the Degoliers and the Vichyists facing each other exchanged rare shots and more often engaged each other in argument. Occasionally a Glen Martin flew in from Libreville and dropped a few bombs and many leaflets on our soldiers. The next day a Block 200 would come from Brazzaville and repay the enemy in the same way. These protracted and tedious operations had no result. Immediately after my arrival, I decided to capture Libreville and drew up a plan of action. Unfortunately, it was to be feared that our forces would encounter serious resistance. General Tatu, who was at Libreville, had at his disposal four battalions of infantry, artillery, four modern bombers, the messenger ship Bougainville, and the submarine Poncelet. He mobilized a certain number of colonists. On the other hand, the orders he received obliged him to fight. To prevent him from getting reinforcements, I had to ask Churchill to warn Vichy that if General Tattoo was sent reinforcements, the British Navy would intervene. My telegram caused Admiral Cunningham to come to Douala. We agreed that his ships would not take a direct part in the battle for Libreville, but that they would be on the high seas to prevent the Vichyists from Dakar from sending their cruisers again, if by any chance they should be so inclined. As for us, we were going into this operation with a heavy heart, and I announced, to which all agreed, that in this operation of sorrow to us, no one would be marked in the order. On October 27, the post of Mitzik was taken. On November 5, the garrison of Lambertine laid down its arms. Immediately afterwards, transports left Iwala, on board of which was a detachment of troops sent to Libreville. The clerk was in charge of the whole operation. Koenig led the ground forces, a battalion of the Foreign Legion and a combined colonial battalion composed of Senegalese riflemen and colonists from Cameroon. The troops were landed at Cape Mondouch on the night of November 8, and on November 9 heavy fighting broke out on the approaches to the city. On the same day, under the command of Major Marmier, several Lisson airplanes, brought by us in disassembled form from England and hastily assembled in Douala, flew over the area and dropped bombs. It was then that the Savorgnan de Brazza, with Dargent Liu on board, accompanied by the Commando Domini, came to the roadstead where the Bougieville was standing. In spite of friendly appeals, repeated several times by our ships, the Bougainville opened fire. Taking the fight, the Brazza set fire to that ship. At this time a battalion of the Foreign Legion broke the resistance of the Vichy units at the airfield. Soon after Dargent Liu sent General Tetu a telegram urging him to cease fighting. The enemy capitulated. Koenig occupied Libreville. Paran, who had been appointed by me governor of Gabon, assumed his post. Unfortunately, there were about 20 men killed. On the previous day, the submarine Poncelet, which had left Port Gentile, had met one of Cunningham's cruisers on the high seas and fired a torpedo at her. The cruiser threw depth bombs at her and the boat surfaced. The submarine crew was picked up by the British, and the commander, Captain Third Rank Sussian, sank his ship and courageously died with him. It remained to occupy Port Gentile. This happened on November 12 after lengthy negotiations and the fortress offered no resistance. The only victim of this last operation was Governor Massoy, who having joined Gabon to free France in August, then rejoined Vichy. A weak-willed man, driven to despair by this mistake and its consequences. He, after the capture of Libreville, took a position on the Brazza, and then, with Colonel Crutchio, General Tattoo's chief of staff, landed at Port Gentile in order to persuade the administrator and the garrison not to engage in fratricidal fighting. This helped to avert disaster, but Masson, broken by the nervous shock he had just suffered, hanged himself in his cabin on the return voyage. I arrived at Libreville on November 15 and at Port Gentile on November 16. A feeling of satisfaction prevailed among the inhabitants at having succeeded 
in extricating themselves from a ridiculous situation. I visited in the hospital the wounded on both sides, who were now together in recovery. I then met with the commanding staff of the Vichy units. A few had joined Free France. Most of the commanders who, at the request of their superior, had given their word that they would remain loyal to the marshal, expressed a wish to be interned. They resumed their service when North Africa took part in the war, and, like many others, bravely did their duty. General Tetu was placed in the care of the monks of the Order of the Holy Ghost Fathers and then transferred to a Brazzaville hospital. From there he also left for Algeria in 1943. Radio in Dakar, Vichy and Paris was in a frenzy, while only a few weeks earlier it had been trumpeting victory. I was accused of bombing, burning and looting Libreville, and even shooting prominent people, including Bishop Tardy. I suspected that the Vichyists, by resorting to such lies, wanted to cover up some of their baseness. During the Dakar operation, they arrested three free French pilots who had landed unarmed at the Uakame airfield, as well as Boamba, Bissanier and Kors, who had been unofficially sent by me to the city with Dr. Brunel to agitate there in favour of free France. Only one of these missionaries, Brunel, managed to escape to British Gambia after the events in Dakar. The charges made by the Dakar authorities gave me the suspicion that perhaps they intended to take out their anger on these free Frenchmen whom they had captured. This supposition was all the more probable, because after my quite correct address to Boyson proposing to exchange the prisoners for Tetu and his officers, Radio Dakar immediately reported my demarche, accompanied by many insulting and provocative comments. I then warned the Vichy High Commissioner that I had in my hands many of his friends who would be responsible for the lives of those free Frenchmen he was holding in prison. The tone of the Dakar radio immediately softened. A number of signs, however, indicated the confusion into which the events had thrown the Vichy rulers. The vile jubilation with which they had greeted the conclusion of the armistice quickly dissipated. Contrary to what they had recently claimed to justify their surrender, the enemy had not broken England. On the other hand, the accession of many colonies to de Gaulle, then the Dakar operation and finally the Gabon operation convinced everyone that, although Free France knew how to use the radio, it was by no means a bunch of mercenaries at the microphone. Quite suddenly, everyone began to realise that Free France was a purely national organisation and the Germans had to factor into their plans the increasing difficulties the resistance would cause. While in the depths of Africa, I noticed signs of nervousness which the Vikiists were beginning to show in connection with the unfolding events. In the first period after the Dakar operation, they tried to act with brute force. Aircraft from Moroccan airfields dropped bombs on Gibraltar, but soon they tried peaceful means. Telegrams I received from Churchill and Eden informed me of the negotiations which had begun on October 1 in Madrid between Ambassador de la Baume and his English counterpart, Sir Samuel Hoare. They were about obtaining from the English permission to deliver to France cargoes from Africa on condition that the Germans should not take possession of these cargoes. But in addition, de la Baume declared on behalf of Bordouin that if the enemy seized these cargoes, the government would move to North Africa and France would resume the war on the side of the United Kingdom. Noting the confusion evidenced by such statements, I felt it necessary to caution the British. It was difficult to understand how people who had themselves given up the state to the enemy and condemned those who wanted to fight could suddenly turn into supporters of the resistance. And the reason for this would be merely the fact that the invader would take food for himself beyond that which he took daily. And indeed, despite the efforts of the London government to support the Vichy government in the good intentions that it revealed, despite the personal messages addressed to Marshal Pitain by the British King and the President of the United States, Despite the contact established by the British with Weygand, who was then in Algeria, and Nogues, who was still in Morocco, soon under the pressure of the Germans, all these hopes collapsed. October 24, Petain met with Hitler in Montoir. It was officially announced the cooperation of Vichy with the enemy. Finally, in the first days of November, the Vichy stopped negotiations in Madrid. Henceforth, quite understandable reasons, led me to finally declare the illegitimacy of the Vichy rulers, to assume responsibility for the fate of France and to begin to exercise the functions of government in the liberated territories. To this temporary power, which bound past and present, I gave the form of a republic, declaring my obedience and responsibility to the sovereign people and solemnly pledging myself to report to them as soon as they had regained their freedom. On October 27, 
On French soil in Brazzaville, I defined our national and international position in a manifesto, two resolutions and a basic declaration, documents that were to become the charter of our movement. I believe that I always acted in the spirit of that charter until the day five years later when I handed over to the national government the powers I had assumed. On the other hand, I created the Council of Defense of the Empire, designed to assist me with its advice. To it I introduced at first Catrus, Muselia, Cassin, Larmin, Sissi, Soto, Dargentlu, and Lickler. Finally, in a note addressed to the British government on November 5, I definitively defined the position of Free France with regard to the Vichy government and its proconsuls like Wigand or Nogues, who, according to the stubborn optimists, were to one day engage the enemy, and called upon our allies to support that position. In the end, if our African venture did not achieve all its objectives, a solid base had nevertheless been established from the Sahara to the Congo, and from the Atlantic Ocean to the Nile Basin for the deployment of our war effort. In the early days of November, I established a command in the field to direct our actions. Eboe, who had been appointed Governor-General of French Equatorial Africa, settled at Brazzaville with Marchand, the commander of the troops. Lepi, summoned from London, became Governor of the Territory of Chad, and Administrator Konari became Governor of Cameroon where he replaced Leclerc. The latter, in spite of his objections, prompted by a desire to continue at Douala the work he had begun, was sent to the territory of Chad to superintend operations in the Sahara, where, after passing through severe hardships, he won fame. Finally, Lomina, High Commissioner with civil and military powers, was to exercise general direction. Before leaving for London, I worked out with Lomina a plan of action for the coming months. It was a question, on the one hand, of carrying out the first raids of motorized forces and air raids on Merzouke and the oases of Kufra. On the other hand, it was about sending a combined brigade to Eritrea, as well as a bomber air group which were to take part in combat operations against the Italians. This expedition was to begin the participation of French forces in the campaign in the Middle East. But in addition, it was necessary to recruit staff, command and arm units intended to gradually reinforce these forward formations, both in the Sahara and on the Nile. It is difficult to imagine the effort required to mobilize, train, equip and transport. In the vast expanse of Central Africa, in the climatic conditions of the equator, the troops we sought to create and send into battle over vast distances. It is even more difficult to imagine the colossal work that had to be done to accomplish this. On November 17, I left Free French Africa for England via Lagos, Freetown, Bathurst, and Gibraltar. As the plane went through the autumn rain over the ocean, I mentally pictured the incredible roundabouts that the fighting French were henceforth to take in this strange war, in order to strike the Germans and Italians. I thought of the obstacles that stood in their way, of which the greatest, unfortunately, had been erected before them by the French themselves but I was encouraged by the enthusiasm which the cause of France awakened in the hearts of those who were ready to serve it. I thought of the inspiring feats that awaited them in various parts of the globe. However harsh the facts might be, perhaps I could meet them. Because I could, in Chateaubriand's phrase, lead the French on the wings of a dream.